Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Q&A. Almost forgot I did these. <laughs> Not quite, but uh, it's been a while. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions to go through. Uh, there is a pretty decent selection here, as you guys should all be aware. There's a lot of stuff going on with the story right now. Not all of these are necessarily going to be about the story. I mean, I'm going to have a, uh, a follow-up video talking about a lot of discussions and theories and sort of what I'm settled on speculation-wise for now. Uh, probably that'll be going up tomorrow, but for today, let's just talk about a bunch of other stuff to do with Guild Wars 2 and more. Uh, the first one is... It's quite a hefty one, but I'm not going to cut any of it out from Aron23, who says, WP, I find it interesting how you have such differed opinions on immersion into the game on one hand and character wardrobe clipping, etc. on the other. You regularly amaze me by how far you go to increase the immersion in Guild Wars 2, making map tours, new ways to tweak your interface and whatnot. At the same time, you said you value standing out with your character more than creating a cool look for yourself. Here's my stance on this. From what I've experienced lately, especially in big gathering places like Lion's Arch, Things like shiny back items, burning armor pieces, even legendaries, or some other rare weapon skins are becoming more and more the standard, at least for high level characters. At some point, standing out is actually not about flashy equipment anymore because you're just one winged, burning, ethereal, glowing, eternity wielder in many. Coming back to the question of immersion, for me personally, wearing ridiculous flashy equipment actually breaks the immersion completely, apart from some very rare cases where the player actually managed to create a cohesive look for his character. For me, immersion is tightly linked to having an authentic believable character whether you're actually RPing or not and that on the other hand is linked to having a believable outfit having blue glowy wings on your back or shooting rainbows with your bow really destroys that for me as I would much rather play a character that I can actually on some weird way imagine myself meeting without fireworks and rainbows going off in every direction love to hear your opinion on this do you draw a line between game immersion and extravagant character outfits are these two things maybe on two entirely different levels for you they absolutely are on entirely different levels and I can understand why people would say I mean obviously the dreamer is the big one in Guild Wars 2 a bow that fires unicorns people get really angry about it and they get angry about the fact that it's got a tattoo on its hind uh, of arena net just saying you know this is even more emotion breaking but to me in an MMO, there is really very little about player characters that holds the immersion, right? Unless I was full on RPing, I'm never going, no matter what another player is wearing in an MMO, I'm never going to walk over to that player and remain immersed. Because the second I walk over to the other player and I see that they're not an NPC, my brain switches immediately to the fact, oh, this is a human being I can communicate with. This is a human being who might be about to swear at me. This is a human being that might be about to uh, talk to me about his cool new hairstyle style because he looks like a Dragon Ball Z character. He doesn't necessarily have to be doing anything immersion breaking. He might be wearing cultural armor and just sat on a bench somewhere. But that doesn't mean I'm still in like Tyria mode. That means I'm in, oh, hey, here's, here's a person, someone I can interact with. And as I say, unless you're full on RPing and expecting them to RP back at you, you're not thinking about Tyria anymore. You're thinking about Guild Wars 2, the MMO. And the same thing applies to my character too. Uh, especially when it comes to stuff like playing other races. Like I don't play, not, I don't have a single character on my account who is a human male of around my age, right? There isn't a single character that I'm actually trying to project myself into. I spend most of my time playing on Asuran characters and I don't think of them as an extension of me. Whenever I think of my character, that again, just like when I see other players' characters, that's just a reminder that I'm playing Guild Wars 2, the MMO. And so therefore, when I'm looking at this, really I'm just thinking about the social elements of the game and I'm thinking about how I can stand out. And you're totally right. Standing out in Guild Wars 2 is now a lot more than wielding legendaries. Uh, there's so much flash in the game now and it's so easily attainable. You've got two routes you can go down. You can be as flashy as you possibly can, which is what I'm doing with my Asura, just because all the models are so small. Or you can go for some kind of elegant, cohesive look. And every now and then you will find someone who has that elegant, cohesive look. And it makes them stand out. But everything about the way I make my character look isn't about immersion. It's about impressing other people. And people joke about, you know, EPing and stuff. But I really think that that comes into it for anyone's mentality while they're playing an MMO. There are single player games where you can dress your character up and try and make them look cool. And I would certainly say in single player games like the Elder Scrolls series, I would rather have more of a cohesive look. But even there, I would still say I'm not really 
projecting into them. Every time I see my character, I think, right, that is my avatar. That is a me. This is just a thing that I'm controlling. You know, I find it kind of interesting the way, like, League of Legends does its lore almost, that it accounts for you controlling your champion, you know, you the summoner, and they, like, fully embrace that idea. So that that's the line for me, definitely. Um, I do think you can play an MMO for immersion, but when I talk about immersion, I'm talking about um, forgetting that I'm playing the game, and when the character itself reminds me so much that I'm playing a game, even beyond aesthetics, like I look at my Bifrost and I'm like, oh yeah, that looks really flashy. But I'm also thinking about the fact, oh yeah, and it's a cool legendary weapon, it was hard to get, and I can change the stats. These aren't immersive thoughts that I'm having. When I think about immersion and extending my immersion in this game, I'm thinking about stuff like uh, removing as much of the UI as possible, being able to listen to the NPCs that are around, explore the world and find cool things in the environment. There's a reason why I think first person camera perspectives are so immersive. It's because it stops you even having to look at your character and it ups the ante even further. It makes it easy, even easier to forget that you are playing a video game. So yeah, that's the line for me. Um, definitely there is a big, very big one. And because I don't care so much when it comes about my character, I also don't care about clipping or using a load of outrageous effects that don't blend together very well at all. Uh, the next question is a much more simple one. It's from Osar with two bunnies who says, For the Ellie staff build, if I go with assassin stats, should I still use Zerk trinkets? Uh, I haven't really dungeon run or anything for a while, but I think my knowledge on this is still sound. Uh, you can do whatever you want, really. You can go a assassin's Zerk's split. Or you can go pure Zerks, or you can go pure Assassins. Just remember the golden rule, that if you're doing like optimum stuff, the goal is to get to 100% crit chance, or as close to it as possible, without going over. After you're at that point, and that includes extra stuff from allies, like Spotter and the Banner of Discipline, once you are at that point of fury that they might give you, then you should just be building for power as much as possible. The main difference, in my opinion, between these two stats is uh, team gameplay versus solo gameplay. On most classes, you'll find if you you play a lot of solo stuff, Assassins is better because you can have higher precision in general and that's going to be worth more damage. But if you're doing a lot of really team oriented stuff and you want absolute 100% bang for your buck, then you should go with Zerks. But yeah, mostly it's quite free and easy. Uh, Israel Cortez says, Hey WP, I've got a question since watching your Guild Wars 2, Guild Wars and Let's Plays. I've now learned something about myself and so I wanted to ask you a question. I learned that I love story more in a game rather than good mechanics and secret places as I always want to rush the game to see the ending. But what do you prefer more? It would seem you prefer mechanics more, but from watching all of your lore videos it's almost as if you are tall between. What are your thoughts? I thought this was an interesting question because most people might disagree with, with what this person's asking me. I had a conversation with someone in my guild just recently where they basically said it seems you really love to dive into the lore and stuff of games Look at uh, FFX that you're playing. You're really diving into the lore. I actually disagree with that If you are watching the FFX stuff, you'll notice most of the story in that game Yeah, it's a really story heavy focused game and I'm enjoying the story and I'm being careful not to spoil stuff for people And that is a big reason why I like it, but most of the story is just out there in your face, right? It's well done. This is why it feels like it has a good story It's all laid out there for me and the audience. I'm not really talking about the story. I'm just letting the cutscenes play. I actually have very little to say on the story. What I'm talking about most in FFX is mechanics stuff. I'm talking about all the weird little things that you can do with characters, hidden chests in various places, interesting uses of spheres, the side content, the extra overdrives, different modes. You know, this is all mechanics. That's what I spend most of my time talking about in that Let's Play. Um, and I think the thing with me is I just like, particularly when I'm doing like YouTube videos, I spend more time focusing on things that the game won't elaborate to, to people. Like, the fun part of it, I've never really considered myself much of a teacher, but I think the fun part of it is teaching people the stuff they wouldn't normally know. And so, I kind of am in this role now, particularly with the Guild Wars 2 community, where a lot of people think, oh yeah, this guy's really into the lore, he's really into the story. You know, that doesn't mean that I prefer the story stuff over the mechanic stuff a lot of the time. I just fell into that with Guild Wars, because Guild Wars, Guild Wars 1 at the very least, which is where I began, a long let's play of that, um, is very is like the opposite of Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X has loads of interesting little mechanics things you can go into if you like, but in general you can get through the game anyway because it's kind of easy, and it throws a lot of story in your face. Guild Wars 1 was the complete opposite. People got to grips with the mechanics very well, and indeed, especially for like hard mode content and stuff, you'd have to know the mechanics quite well. But the story... 
The story was really rich and had a lot of depth and was quite fascinating on many levels, but it was incredibly easy to miss. Even people playing like loose attention eventually wanted to skip cutscenes and they'd never read the blocks of text, let alone read the text for side quests and find the really stupid and obscure ways that the devs had designed stuff and things had fallen flat. So when I began with my uh, journey on YouTube doing Guild Wars stuff, that was the main thing I was focusing on. It wasn't mechanics, people knew that stuff, it was the story. And so that came forward and I took that with me into Guild Wars 2. Um, and so if you ask me the question, what do I prefer? The lore or the mechanics? You know, I really couldn't tell you. I could tell you that uh, in my YouTube life, I'm just trying to teach people stuff they wouldn't already know. But what do I prefer most? I guess it would have to depend entirely on the game. Like in Mass Effect, I really paid very little attention to a lot of the like the mechanics based stuff and I didn't really care about leveling my guys or whatever. Just whatever I could do to get through the mission. But then like in Mass Effect 2, whenever I'd get to the spaceship, I would be constantly speaking to every single NPC, every window of opportunity I could, just so I could squeeze out a little bit more of the story. But in other games, you know, it's more of the mechanics that you end up caring about. I think when I LP'd Legend of Grimrock, that was a really interesting series because there was very little story there to keep you going. Uh, and mostly it was mechanics based stuff but I was still very enthused by the story at the same time. I guess there is no uniform answer or if there is I don't know about it myself at the moment either. Next question is from Jan Fink who says, Hey WP, I was wondering how much of a chance do you think the Kodan have to become a playable race? I would love to see new maps in their capital city in the far Shiver Peaks. And do you think we could see this in the living story as Kodan join in fight against Jormag or in expansion? Uh, I don't really think they have a capital city in the far Shiver Peaks necessarily. Uh, the lore of the Kodan is that they were even further north than the far Shiver Peaks in theory, across seas to the north. But when Jormag arose, he like terrorized those lands, brought massive of blizzards and uh, storms that were never ceasing. So many Kodan eventually decided, right, we need to go south. And they sailed here on their icebergs. Whenever you find a sanctuary of the uh, Kodan, they're on their icebergs, right? It's kind of weird because... They're in a pool of water in Guild Wars 2, aren't they? That basically feels like it's separated from the rest of the large bodies of the world. Unless their, like, capital city was a huge, you know, fleet of icebergs that were all floated together and it all comes, you know, generally south from their original location, but now in the far Shiver Peaks. I don't know how appropriate it would be for us to get to really the heart of Kodan culture. I do think they're in a really interesting race and they've totally fallen out of the story, haven't they? I mean, it would be stupid for Arena Net to try and force them in here anyway with current stuff going on with Scarlet and dry top it would just be stupid to see a Kodan around right now um, but I'm sure they will come into the story a bit more later it just won't be for a long time I've always had the opinion of the Kodan that yeah they'd be kind of an interesting playable race I'd probably opt for them as a playable race after Tengu like if I was gonna devise an order I'd be like yeah Tengu first and then maybe Kodan or Lagos I don't know which I mean Lagos are in kind of a weird position because they're meant to be so mysterious right now but the other thing to consider about the Kodan is um, a really cool place the devs could take that story story is that they just end up evil and they end up against us in some way. There's a lot about Kodan culture about how they believe that they're better than everyone else and they're just here to judge us and they actually uh, have a lot to do with balance. They believe uh, a lot in keeping the, nat the natural balance of the world and many themes of the current story, especially if you look at like the stuff to do with that cutscene we got with the eternal alchemy and so forth. It's all about how balance has now been knocked out somehow and maybe this was Scarlet's ultimate goal to knock this system out of whack. Zaitan is now defeated and it's thrown you know things off so maybe there's some cause to see some Kodan there but uh, the story I'd like to see them go down would have us basically against them now obviously that doesn't mean we can't play with them at the same time in fact every single playable race already in Guild Wars 2 has an evil faction of some kind um, but I just think it's a long way off sadly I was interested to get a question about the Kodan actually because seriously who's thinking about the Kodan right now apparently this guy uh, someone asked, I can't remember who it was, and I sort of hate the new YouTube comment system. Some of it's good, but the inbox stuff is rubbish. Like, so I saw this comment and I don't think I can get back to it. So someone asked, hopefully you're watching and you know that you're the guy, but basically asked about sh the idea of showing off absolutely everything there is to show off in a game, which is what I'm doing with FFX at the moment. And it is an interesting topic. I've never really talked about it on the channel. Um, basically, the, the idea here is if you are showing off absolutely everything in the game, isn't this kind of a bad thing for the devs? What's the point in the people in the audience 
buying the game for themselves if you're just going to throw everything out there on a plate. Well, you know, there's a reason that video games are treated different legally to like movies. It would be illegal for me to broadcast a movie out to thousands of people without them paying for it, but a video game is different. A video game is different for every single person who plays it. But then when you talk about very heavily story focused games like Final Fantasy X and then you have a Let's Player who shows off every single alternate scene which is what I've been doing. Where is the line there? Is this a wrong thing? I find it a really interesting topic because it's sort of like saying, look, the lazier people, dare I use this term, the lazier people who don't know so much about the game that they're let's playing, they're just, uh, they're just playing it for fun. Maybe lazy is the wrong word, but you know, they're just playing it for fun. Maybe they're doing a blind playthrough and people are watching because that person's funny and you know, there's big reactions coming from them. Those guys that don't show everything off and, and did less research in theory, those are in better standing legally than the ones that sit down and do long test files like I did with FFX and do a bunch of research and look everywhere they can for trivia and show everything off. It's like saying you're putting in more work and you're actually putting yourself more into a grey area legally. Is this worthwhile doing? Um, for me, I try not to think about it too much. I don't really think it's anything that can be punishable for a while. I think the value add of having commentary on there all the time does provide a very different experience to if someone sat down and played it themselves. I think the only way um, like a law would be passed or something that would prove, you know, this cannot be done would be if you could prove, right, that someone sat down and played Final Fantasy X with no outside interference and they did the exact same things as me, like the general, the whole way through the game. You know, they did the same attack patterns in battles and they used the sphere grid in the exact same way and they got no extra value out of that game for buying it from themselves. But I would argue that's impossible to happen. You're always going to get extra value. Even if I've shown you all the story stuff, when it comes to the actual mechanics of the game, you may have a situation where you fight a boss that I breezed through, but he nearly wiped your team. And so you had that flash of excitement that you managed to recover from and managed to kill the boss. And you had more fun fighting that boss than you had watching me fight that boss. So you had a value add that was worth in purchasing it for yourself. And you can't really argue otherwise. People can't argue that I've taken all of the value out of buying the game. But obviously you can't uh, blanket apply this to everything. There are some games that really have very little gameplay at all. And, you know, if the developer really feels that... Uh, you know, a let's play, a comprehensive let's play of it up on YouTube would seriously damage their sales, then uh, it's up to the developer to try and pursue that line, right? And try and get them removed. But, uh, you know, there's also statistics that show that whenever someone does a let's play, even if it is really co comprehensive, they drive sales for the game that it probably wouldn't have had otherwise. I've had a lot of people with my FFX saying, oh yeah, I've bought it so I can play along with you, oh, the nostalgia is awesome and so forth, so I don't feel bad, even slightly. I guess my point is that because ultimately you couldn't apply like a blanket law banning something like a comprehensive let's play, it should just be down to the developer. So if anything needs to change, it just needs to be that developers have a more easy, and accessible way of pulling series that they don't like online like if that developer is foolish enough to want to pull the let's plays even though maybe it is driving their sales just because they think it's damaging then they should be empowered to do that and as time goes by and statistics come in that show oh look all of the games that have a lot of content about them on youtube are outperforming the other games developers themselves will decide no we will allow this stuff and everybody ends up winning Anyway, that's a big topic that a lot of YouTubers I watch cover all the time, so we'll, we'll leave it there. Next question is from Carl Berber who says, Hey WP, now that The Living Story will be replayable at any time, how will you handle spoilers on your videos? Okay, in my opinion, the spoiler-based stuff is going to be actual story things, alright? Which I will not be releasing on the first day. Current plan is, as long as things continue as they have been, I have been getting earlier access to the patches so that I can provide content for you guys the moment it goes live. I cannot upload anything until the patch itself is live on the client. So in theory, I could make a video about anything I wanted within the patch and have it up there on YouTube the first minute that comes out. For example, this big Eternal Alchemy video, I could have had that on online in the first minute and there wouldn't technically be anything wrong with that but that would be pretty spoilery okay so everything uh, to one extent or another in my opinion is a spoiler even just seeing the new maps is a spoiler to some people who wanted that really fresh experience I had a video this week that went out of me exploring the new area and it had that fantastic vista in it where you go from the craggy area and then it just explodes into the beautiful oasis that was a wow moment a wow moment I got to experience in game but anyone who watched my video before playing probably had it lessened because they saw it there they were spoiled on that however the stance I'm taking is because I do want to be able to produce content and throw out straight away is um gameplay stuff 
new map stuff and environments. These are on the table for me. These are things that I'm going to be talking about absolutely as soon as the patch comes out. Probably after the patch comes out, on the following day, you'll usually have some further elaboration, speculation or discussion on the story, which is exactly what I did this week. You know, I did those initial videos, then the next day we talked about the Eternal Alchemy. So uh, that's kind of my idea. I do have some other ideas for videos too, but, um, you know, spoiler-wise, that is the plan, and you guys are just going to have to determine whether you think those are spoilers or not. Basically, on the first day, there's not going to be any story spoilers on my channel, but there will be stuff about the mechanics and the new areas we can go to. I think, in my opinion, and that's fair. That's a video that I would be happy to watch, so that's the video I'm going to be happy to upload. One last question from MMO Inks. I'll keep it quite short since we've been going quite long. How important is the music for you in games in general, but especially MMOs? Recently, McLean Deemer was given the opportunity to work with a live orchestra for Living Story Season 2, and in that trailer, it sounded amazing. You're right, though. The music is fantastic. Do you know what one of the main comments I've heard from people about the new patches? Oh, and the music's so good. I did that immersive tour on the first week where I had barely any commentary. I did another one where I had a bit more, but still a lot of focus on the game's audio. And that music will blow you away. It really is fantastic music. The thing is with me, particularly for MMOs, right? MMOs are games you end up spending a lot of time playing, loads of time. Eventually, not just the music, I mean they're adding more music in right now, but it's going to stop at some point, right? Not just the music, but the sound effects of the game too get old on your ears. You get bored of them. You stop noticing them. I kind of pair sound design and the audio of a game in the same way as I would pair the graphics and the visual experience of the game. After a while, if you spend any game at all playing for long enough and it's still giving you reasons to play, you're not really focusing on the graphics anymore and you're not really focusing on the sound design anymore. Think about this, right? Uh, if you were to go back to an old game, let's say you have an old favourite PS1 game. Everyone imagine what your favourite PS1 game was, right? Or even older. For a while, when you first load that game up, you notice, you're like, wow, these graphics look a lot worse than I remember. But what are you thinking about like two hours after that, three hours after that? You're not thinking about the graphics anymore. You're just thinking about the gameplay itself. The same thing happens with MMO. MMOs, if you ask me, and the same thing happens with sound design. And what people eventually end up doing is they get bored of what they're hearing all the time, they don't care about it anymore because there's nothing new that's exciting them, and they start playing their own music. This is the way I've always treated MMOs anyway. Um, if I've been playing it long enough, I basically get the client gets quieter and quieter and quieter as I press the bar down further and further, and then I just start playing music in the background. Or, or you know, I'm listening to Ventrilo or TeamSpeak or Skype or something, and then maybe some music on top of that too. The actual audio of Guild Wars 2's client goes off completely, which is why it's been such a nice shock for a lot of people, I, I would then say with this new patch, they hear, oh yeah, Arena has put in a load of new music, and other sound effects too, I would presume, and then they actually turn this stuff back up, and they get that enjoyment again too. That said, even though I do end up muting it, I do think it is incredibly important, I think the new maps, if they didn't have this new music, would have really suffered for it, the new music really brings them out, and not only for that initial experience while you're enjoying those tracks, but also uh, for later on, I think the biggest thing for me, and probably many other people, is um, music helps you to key into nostalgia really, really strongly. You know, if you did only ever listen to Guild Wars 2 soundtracks and then you stopped playing the game, went back in five years and someone just played you the OST, you would be filled with nostalgia. Like, nostalgia just works for me out of music on such a high level. More than even, like, seeing screenshots and stuff of the game. If I hear the music, I have an immediate and powerful connection to that game that makes me want to play it again. And I do think MMOs kind of suffer a little bit in the, um, after a while, because everyone mutes it and starts listening to some music, that, that gets weaker. You know, I don't get very nostalgic. I I've got to be honest about Guild Wars 1 music. Maybe it's because I've done used it so much in videos and you know I've done a lot of audio editing with those tracks. But I also remember while Guild Wars 1 was still out um, I went through a PvP phase in that game where I was just doing like loads of random arenas basically for a long time. Um, but the stupid thing that I was doing while I was playing random arenas was I had the music muted and instead I was playing my own music. And like, uh, you know, many teenagers probably do, you get super into a band, right? The band I was into was the Killers at the time and in particular I was listening to Hot Fuss constantly. This same album over and over and over. Uh, I did that with PvP, put Guild Wars 1 down for a while, you know, maybe came back to it six months later and the reason I came back to it I remember very clearly was because um, someone played a track from Hot Fuzz I think it was Jenny was a friend of mine and all I could think of with this song was running around in random arenas it was the weirdest thing so now this song was what had made me nostalgic about Guild Wars 1 and thinking about Guild Wars 1 and undoubtedly that would happen again if I didn't listen to such a variety of music now while playing GW2 you know it's not necessarily a negative thing but it does mean I don't get that nostalgic pull from the Guild Wars 1 
one soundtracks, and I probably won't have such a big one from the Guild Wars 2 soundtracks. But other single player games where I did the entire thing listening just to their audio, that will still be there. Anyway, uh, there you go. That's the uh, last question for today. I did have a couple more. We'll be having another one of these next week. Hope you guys enjoyed. Leave any questions you may have down below. And I guess I'll see you next time, which will be for some more stuff to do with the living story and my conclusions. So I uh, look forward to that. Hope you guys have a great day.